hello. I would say thanks for coming, but I don't want a big crowd. Uh, um, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, body language. Um, and before we start, I've got a few warnings for you. Apparently, cave auditor means uh, beware the listener, or something like that, and that's you. My notes are on my phone, so I'm not looking at tweets or anything. Um, so the first warning is this. You are going to be involved, uh, and I'm going to try some experiments, some of which may go drastically wrong, uh, but we'll try. And it's possible that by the end of the session, you will hate the person you're sitting next to. <laughs> so make sure it's not somebody that you need to communicate with over the next uh, month or two. Um, this is my little get out clause. None of this is my own idea. I don't want to be challenged about it later. Um, a lot of it has come from a, in my pre TEFL days, uh, I worked in Leeds Prison. And I say worked. Uh, <laughs> for about three years, so you can work out. Um, and it was there in the prison that I first came across uh, this idea of body language, as you can imagine. Uh, and we used some training materials from an Australian guy, whose name I will give you later if you think this talk is fascinating, uh, and it's mostly his fault. Um, but some of it comes from my own observations in the prison, uh, in my work, and so on. Um, this is my next get out clause. This is, I'm not doing this session to say my body language is fantastic. I know it's rubbish. Uh, I'm absolutely petrified at the moment, so I'll keep wandering about. Um, and it, I, the other thing I don't want is people coming up to me all day for the next three days going, ha ha, you just did that thing you talked about. <laughs> um, and the fact of the matter is most of this stuff is subconscious anyway. So if I'm doing it to you, it's not because I'm trying to tell you that I hate you uh, at another point. Uh, and another get out clause. I'm going to make lots of generalizations. So again, the idea, I once met somebody who did that. Fine, I'm happy with that. Uh, there's going to be gen some generalizations will be about different genders, different nationalities. Uh, and I'm taking no responsibility for any stereotypes, generalizations, or whatever. Uh, and um, most of it is based on body language research in English-speaking countries. Uh, there are some things where I'm going to mention different cultural things. But again, if you want to say, well, in Ukraine, we don't do that, fine. Or in China, it's done this way. Uh, I'm taking no responsibility for anything. Um, so, why is this idiot talking about body language? Um, there's estimates, uh, and again, I'm not taking responsibility for this, that uh, about 65% of com communication is non-verbal. Uh, we walk away from conversations thinking, I don't trust anything that person said, well, that person was talking rubbish, but we don't really know why. And it's believed, researched, that a lot of it is coming through the signals you're getting in your body. Um, it generally started with this guy. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, he started the ball rolling by writing this book about how animals and human beings express themselves uh, not through language. And basically, if it's good enough for Darwin, it's good enough for me. Um, we tend to throw around words like uh, intuition, hunches, and so on. And again, a lot of this probably comes from your reading of body language that you don't even know about. So you're all good at it anyway. So we can finish the presentation there and all go and have a coffee. Great. Um, uh, basically, 
the minority in the room by the looks of it. Uh, need as much help as you can get. Um, there's a uh, theory, I presume, that a lot of this comes from evolutionary reasons. Um, there was experiments done with crying babies, uh, and they put them in front of, first of all, women who had hunches, intuitions, that the baby was hungry, the baby was upset, the baby was tired, all of those different things. And what do you think happened when they put the same babies in front of the men? All the men saw was a crying baby <laughs> and probably tried to hand it over to the woman and say, can you deal with this? Um, so the idea is that this is an evolutionary benefit, that women can read body language better than men because they need to. Men need to see how fast that large toothed animal is running at them. Uh, and that's the only body language they care about. Um, sorry, men. Uh, so I thought today we'd look at how this affects us communicating as managers, as people who work with other people, and so on. Um, and one more important warning. Uh, like verbal communication, um, spoken communication, you can't just take one decontextualized word, as it were, and say this is what this means. It has to be in context, you have to look at the whole picture, uh, famous examples of you know, people crossing their arms, and people go, oh, they're folding their arms, they're being negative, but of course they could be cold, could just be comfortable for them, they might have broken their arm recently, you don't know about it. Um, so it's almost like taking sentences, paragraphs, you need the context, you need to be able to say. So again, I'm going to look at decontextualized stuff, and if you come up to me later and say, how oh, about you were scratching your nose, you know, I've got a bit of a cold recently, so that might be it. All right, let's start then. Um, I'm going to talk about hands, and this is where you joining in starts. Um, Let's start with handshakes. Uh, are you all sitting near somebody? Yes. Okay, good. Um, can you turn so that you're reasonably comfortable, shake hands with somebody nearby, but don't let go? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> if one hand is on top of the other one, so bent over like that, that person is saying, I'm the boss. You're going to do what I tell you. <laughs> Whereas the person with the handshake underneath, that's the submissive one. OK, you can let go now. So, now you've decided uh, who's the boss and so on. Was it a nice, firm handshake? Or... Uh, bit soppy, bit uh... Now this is, uh, apparently, the best way to think of it is uh, arm wrestling. So when you arm wrestle with somebody, the superior person is uh, like that, and the inferior one is like that. Um, and people use this. I had a, fr a friend of mine when we were teenagers, who, uh, when I grew up and went to prison, he... Uh, <laughs> he grew up and decided to become an estate agent. Uh, and when he became an estate agent, two things happened. One was a set of golf clubs magically appeared in the boot of his car and never got used. And the second one was every time he introduced himself, he put his hand out like that and said, hi, nice to meet you. Because then he's forcing you to uh, go underneath and be submissive. This is the, the manager handshake, the uh, I'm going to be in charge and you're going to do whatever I say. You don't all have to try it out now. I'm not suggesting... <laughs> this isn't a new technique that you can go and use on your teachers. Um, where I work in Georgia, there's a, an ex-US Marine who's constantly badgering me for a job. Um, and being a Marine, he gives me one of those death grip handshakes. <laughs> tries to crush my hand into an oblivion 
um, which apparently is an inferiority complex. And that's the way I like to think of it. So he's... <laughs> It's not going to get him a job, I'll tell you that. Um, so, uh, so we use handshakes. Uh, why, why do we use handshakes? Why do we shake hands? Any ideas? Practically or historically? Uh, historically. Yeah, basically we're showing there's no threat from me. Uh, and now we've evolved it into this power play thing. Um, I don't want you to actually do this, this is just a demonstration. But let's imagine I'm fed up with the way you're sitting and I want everybody to move. So if I say, can everybody on this side of the room move across to this side of the room and everybody over here, can you move over there? How do you feel about that? Comfortable? Fine? Not upset? Good. What about if I say exactly the same thing, hopefully in roughly the same tone of voice, but just change the hand a bit and say, can the people on this side of the room, can you move over there? And the people on this side of the room, can you move over there? Any change? Any uh, feeling that you're being told what to do rather than asked? And what about, can you look, can the people on this side of the room, can you move over there? And the people on this side of the room, can you move over there? That's just rude. That's, <laughs> yeah. it's, you better do it or else. I'll set Tim on you. Um, so we've got fingers. Um, apologies for the names. Uh, fingers. So the first one is this, which apparently is technical term is the baton. Like, what's this used for? Yeah. I need to hit you on the head because you're stupid and I need to hit some sense into you. So you'll go and teach that class now, or you're sacked. And then the next one is this one, which is... Yeah, they call this the dagger. I'm going to sort you out. Uh, so if you watch an argument in the street, it should go from this, you're an idiot, to this. And then the next one is the finger goes in like that. <laughs> And then depending on the piece, I don't know. Um, and we use this with, uh, when we're talking to people, I mean, without thinking. Uh, you, you'll soon realise when somebody starts doing that to you, or when somebody's angry. Now, politicians want to do this, but they've changed it. How do, they, how do politicians change this one? Yeah, they, they turn it into a club rather than a <laughs> stick. So if you vote for me, I'm going to sort the taxes out and take you away and uh, so on. Um, so what's the opposite of that? So the first one I showed you was this. Can you move over here and can you not move over here? Hopefully you felt that was the nicest of the three requests. And why was that? You're offering something. Yeah, it's the open palm thing, the classic. Uh, apparently, historically, I have no weapons. Come and look at me. There's no threat from me. I'm not hiding anything under my arms, down the back of my loincloth. Uh, and therefore, we feel people with their palms open are unthreatening. And again, you'll see politicians with this preacher style come to me. Uh, everything is fine as I increase your taxes. Um, so the open palm gesture tends to make people feel more comfortable. Uh, and some other gestures, which I'm going to do quickly because I've got far too much stuff for 40 minutes. Um, what's the head scratch? Yeah, thinking. However, like most gestures, out of context, it can mean several things. So what else could it mean? I've got fleas, <laughs> yeah. I've got dandruff. Uh, you don't believe what someone's Don't believe it yet. Thinking about it, considering uh, Mark's a lawyer, so I do this a lot when Mark's talking. Um, what about the neck rub? Oof. This is what they call the pain in the neck gesture. Um, so your teacher comes to see you and says, I need the day off tomorrow. Uh, it's not going to be very easy. 
uh, you're a pain in the neck. Um, what about the fluff pick? <laughs> yeah, disapproval board, something like that. I'm not interested in listening to what you've got to say. Uh, someone comes and says, I did a great class with the kids, we had lots of fun. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the chin rub? Yeah, thinking. Thinking, maybe dubious. Uh, apparently it's a beard stroke. So men have a big and women have a little, <laughs> little fluff. Um, now, I once spoke to somebody who didn't believe me about this gesture, and a colleague of ours was sitting nearby. It was in a loud, busy bar, I have to say. And I said, to prove it, go and ask him something that he'll think he knows, but he's not sure. And we came up with, when did West Ham last win the FA Cup? <laughs> and I stood and watched as she wandered over, and he immediately went, mm. <laughs> It was great. So it works. Try it out on somebody. Uh, so we've done the hands, and the other big, powerful body language thing is the eyes. Uh, before we look further into the eye, can you talk to your partner and think of how many expressions, idioms, phrases you can think of that are connected to the eyes? Uh, any interesting expressions? No? Okay. <laughs> but hopefully you notice there are lots of expressions about eyes. Um, exactly. Great. Thank you very much. Who said that? Medal for whoever that was. Um, okay. We're going to try an experiment. This is the one that could go horribly wrong. <laughs> uh, this is where you're going to start hating each other, yeah. Um, let's, let's, uh, okay, this half of the room. Um, can you, uh, right, I'm going to give you about a minute to get to know the person next to you. Can you find out as much as you can about their hobbies, things like that? Just have a normal, natural conversation. Find out you know, what they do at the weekends, what are their hobbies, some social, nice chit-chat. Now, <laughs> <laughs> this half of the room, you've got one minute. Good gesture. Uh, can you not say anything to each other, but just look into each other's eyes? <laughs> Ready? <laughs> no speaking on this. So off you go, you've got one minute. <laughs> uh, people on this side of the room, how well do you think you got to know the person next to you? A little bit. Uh, people on this side of the room? Nobody wants to admit it. Um, a psychologist called Arthur Aaron did this experiment, but for four minutes, with complete strangers. Uh, and he said, consistently, the people who looked into each other's eyes reported that they felt, each other, they, felt they knew each other much better than the people who spent time chatting to each other, making small talk. Uh, they said the people who looked into each other's eyes felt they, they were closer to their a new acquaintance than the people who just chatted. Now I'll leave you to decide what you're going to do with that nugget of information. Um, now what happens to your eyes uh, when you are looking at something positive, somebody you like, somebody you feel nice about? Your pupils dilate and consequently the opposite is they go really small. We have expressions in English, such as this one, um, which reflects this phenomenon. People say, oh, don't trust that man. He's got beady little eyes. And what they're actually referring to is this uh, smallening, if that's the word, of the pupils, um, which makes you feel less close to the other person. This is the reason, apparently, uh, why romantic liaisons are usually in candlelit restaurants so that your eyes automatically <laughs> dilate 
and the person sitting opposite will feel that there is a connection and you like each other and uh, so on. So if you're in a brightly lit restaurant, you need to keep doing that. <laughs> and then rapidly, no, don't rapidly open your eyes. That'll make them squish. Um, and I, 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 I have a niece and nephew who are very small and I tried to observe this over Christmas, uh, but it didn't work, which might say something about how they feel about me. But apparently children dilate their eyes quite a lot. Um, because it gets them attention from adults. They're not doing it on purpose. Um, but this is why when you look at children, they have these sort of big eyes. And what we mean by big eyes is dilated, dilated pupils. And again, it's an evolutionary thing that it gets them attention from the adults, and then they can uh, carry on. And we'll come back to children in a minute. Continuing on the theme with how we look at each other. Uh, three gazes apparently. When you're talking to somebody, uh, the, the first of these is what's called the business gaze. Now apparently this is a triangle from your eyes to somewhere around, well me it's the hairline but on other people it'll be, uh, and it's a triangle above your eyes. Now you can experiment with this later um, but if you look at somebody within that triangle it's called the business gaze, it's very serious some people call it putting the screws on somebody and giving them a hard stare. Uh, and if you look at somebody in that area, then they'll feel things are very uh, businessy. And the opposite being the social gaze, which is again a triangle but the other way up. So from the eyes down to around about the chin. And if you look at somebody in that area of the face, they will feel comfortable. This person likes me, we're sociable, we get on with each other. Um, try this out later in the pub. <laughs> Tell somebody it's their turn to buy you a drink and look at them in this part while you're telling them <laughs> and see how quickly they run off to the bar. If they don't, tell them that way. Uh, and then when it's your turn to buy the drink, you can look here and say, oh, you know, I've got no money and it's your turn. Um, the next one we can skip over a bit, but the third one is the intimate gaze, which is man versus woman, uh, and obviously incorporates a lot more than just the face. Apparently, and again, you can try and experiment with this later, <laughs> women give it in one four hundredth of a second, uh, and whereas men are much, much slower. Uh, <laughs> And this can have cultural factors as well. I'm pretty sure there's nobody Georgian here. Uh, in Georgia, where I work, the intimate gaze for men can last for about two minutes uh, as people wander down the street. Um, and this is how we show interest in other people. Um, and then eye contact. Uh, obviously, now I'm trying to make eye contact with as few of you as possible whilst making it look like I am making eye contact with you, a great trick of the presenter. Um, I'm sure we could have another session on eye contact. Um, apparently about 70% of your information you receive through your senses goes through your eyes. They are your strongest sense um, and therefore the eye contact uh, is quite important. Um, now, if if all that information goes through your eyes, then sometimes we need to control where people are looking. Uh, and I need a volunteer. I'm going to do an experiment. Who'd like to volunteer? Come on then. <laughs> this, my young assistant. Thank you. <laughs> no, you can stand up. Okay, I'm the DOS, clearly. And this is some teacher <laughs> uh, who is a bit defensive. He's crossing his hands in front of him because I haven't told him what he's going to do. <laughs> Great. So here I have the, uh, the schedule for the year. Um, and I'm going to tell him that on Monday he's got a two-hour FCE class followed by a kids class followed by eight-year-old CAE class. <laughs> Uh, and then a business course with some fishermen. Um, 
So I'm going to show him on the schedule. Okay. Now, Bob, I've got your schedule here. Okay, boss. Um, you've got an FCE class at about 10 o'clock in the morning and some little kids, they're about eight years old. Uh, then you're following that with a CAE class mm -hmm. and some fishermen who are doing business. Uh-huh. All right? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Now, where was he looking? Up and down, up and down. He had no idea why <laughs> I was moving the pen up and down. So, correct me. This is the first time in this talk you're going to learn anything. <laughs> You've got a 10 o'clock FCE class. Mm -hmm. Now that glass is uh, very important. I want you to make a good job of it. Okay. After that, here at 11 o'clock, yeah. you've got CAE kids. Okay. Now I know CAE kids. <laughs> I know CAE kids are difficult to teach, but I think you're the right man for the job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Business class. <laughs> yeah. Now they're fishermen. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thanks very much. So you get the point. Because if 70% of the information goes through your eyes and your ears are actually rubbish, there's no point me talking to him unless he's looking at me. Um, so you give him the key information and then I want him to look. And if he doesn't look, if you stand there with the pen, I guarantee they will look. And if they don't, stick it up their nose. <laughs> yeah, think yourself lucky. Um, just as an example of the dilated pupil, uh, a cultural reference you might get. <laughs> Good reaction, thanks. This is from a film. Um, and the joke here is that when he's got his normal cat eyes, everyone thinks, oh, he's a bit of an annoying cat. And then to get everybody inside, he does this, dilates his pupils, and everybody does what you did. He goes, ah, and then he attacks them. Um, so he's tricking them into it. OK, nodding. Uh, what is nodding? Why do we do it? Generally, and let's forget Bulgaria. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Um, and so paying attention, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, there's a cultural interesting thing there. Uh, recently in Georgia, somebody had to explain, uh, one Georgian to another Georgian, that I wasn't nodding to say that I agreed and was going to do everything they were saying. I was just nodding to say that I was listening, um, which is something interesting I've discovered. Um, uh, apparently it comes from the same place as bowing. Uh, it's, it's a lowering of yourself. Uh, and if you lower yourself, which we'll come back to in a second, you make yourself more submissive, and therefore I will go along with what you're saying. So a nod becomes yes. Uh, shake of the head, apparently, is one of the first body language gestures you ever learn. If somebody's trying to put food into your mouth on a spoon, and you can't talk, the best way to stop it is to move your head. And then that person will annoyingly try and do that, so you move it back, and so shaking their head comes to represent no. Um, now, the thing we say it's agreeing, uh, I'm going to go along with what you say. Um, somebody told me an interesting thing over Christmas. Uh, apparently in England there were charity people coming to the house, uh, and the person who was telling me said, I was a bit annoyed because they just asked me questions, say, on the lines of, uh, don't you agree that it's terrible that people are starving in Africa? To which your answer has to be, yes, unless you want to stand in the street saying, uh, I am a fascist, I hate everybody. Um, and it's, it's quite an old sales technique, is to ask people questions where, and also indirect questions where they're not ask, you're not answering the question, you're answering the indirect part. So it's not, you're not answering about the starving, you're answering, do you agree? Um, don't you find that? All those sort of things. Yes, I find that, that's obvious. And you've started saying yes and nodding your head. Uh, and apparently then when they drop in, do you want to give me £100, it's much harder to say no if you've been saying yes and nodding your head. Um, and salespeople were always taught, if somebody's shaking their head while they talk to you, there's very little chance they're going to buy something, so you need to get them into a nodding sort of feel, and then they'll feel more positive, and then the answer is more likely to be yes. 
It won't always be. And I've been very pleased to see that as I've been talking, some people have been nodding <laughs> while I speak. They're either falling asleep. Um, so therefore, if somebody is shaking their head when they talk to you, even if they're not saying no, then there's a good chance that the, the final answer is going to be negative. If you're trying to sell them a car, and they're saying, yes, this looks like a great car, and then when you say, do you want to buy it, they're going to continue and go, nah, not really. Um, and we'll come back to that. Uh, so bowing, we mentioned, um, you are submissive, and apparently saluting comes from uh, hat tipping. You tip your hat to make yourself smaller than you are, and that makes you more submissive, and the bow is a symbolic tap tipping, and not that's going to be useful to you. Um, so, how does height affect communication then? Why the... Uh, I need another volunteer. Um, before I do, this is the Chinese emperor's throne. What do you notice about it? When you're talking to the emperor, where do you think you'll be? Standing next to the chair? No, you'll be down the bottom of the steps, probably lying <laughs> on your front, uh, while he looks down upon you. Um, Napoleon might disagree with this. Uh, stop working. So, how does height affect communication? Um, who do you think has more influence, the taller person or the shorter person? Putting Napoleon out of the, uh, out of the equation. The taller person. Uh, I'd like another volunteer for another experiment. Who wants to volunteer? Not going to do anything now. Bob, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's hope this works. He's now the dot. He's been promoted. Uh, I've been demoted. Um, Good. Um. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> steady. Uh, I'm a teacher. I'm consistently late for class. Uh, I often turn up drunk. Uh, and now you've heard that round town I've been telling everybody that the dot at IH is an idiot. He's got no idea how to run a school. And you're going to give me the telling off of my life. You're really going to go to town on me. Okay. But to make it easier on you, yeah. I'm going to lie on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> right, off you go. <laughs> Tell me off. What the hell have you been saying? I can't believe you've been talking about this stuff behind my back. Don't do it again. You, sir, you, sir, are fired. You're gone. Great. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh. Good telling off? Yeah. Okay, let's try it again. Exactly the same thing. This time, you're on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me off. <laughs> this is a really, really odd act. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Listen, I've had enough of you, and the way you are, you, sir, are fired. Get Thanks. out of my building. Thanks very much. <laughs> we can get up. Good dos again, thank you. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> so which one do you think was easier? Obviously it's an exaggeration, but I can tell you I felt much more in control of the situation standing over him. This is why kings and queens, emperors, sit on these high chairs. Um, and this is why probably the largest chair in the school is in your director's office. <laughs> And it's the same in most uh, places in the world. Personal space. All feel comfortable in personal space. Good, let's skip through. How close is too close in personal space for you? This is largely going to depend on where you come from. I come from a small town in the north of England. When I lived in a Chinese city of 14 million people, do you think there was any conflict in personal space at all? Absolutely loads. Um, and this is the reason why next time you get into a lift full of people or a tube train full of people, <coughs> it's obviously the most comfortable you've ever felt in your life and you're quite happy to chat to the people around you. But normally we uh, defend ourselves by removing all facial expressions and staring at the numbers on the lift uh, as they go up. Um, just quickly, strategic invasions of personal space. Uh, this is where people use 
this knowledge of personal space to strategically attack you. Uh, this is something you can try out if you have dinner with somebody. Anytime people sit around a table, they subconsciously divide it into territories. This is my territory, this is your territory. As you're talking to somebody, especially if you're negotiating, just casually push the salt <laughs> across the middle line, and push your glass onto their half of the table and see how they respond. There's a good chance they'll get defensive about it. Um, and culturally, it's, it's a minefield. Uh, every country I've worked in has different uh, ideas on personal space and so on. God, I've got loads today. Uh, right, quick, lying. Apparently lying is one of the first strategies you learn. Uh, back to the children with their dilated pupils, children have a large uh, tool bag of strategies. And apparently the first one they learn is things like strategic crying. Uh, there's actually nothing wrong with me, but I need some attention or I want to get something my way. Uh, and they're basically lying. No, nothing's wrong with me, I'm crying. Uh, so we've basically you've been practicing all your life. Um, now, apparently, and this is my cop-out word, apparently, um, lying is cognitively demanding because you have to tell somebody something, you have to cover up the truth, try and stop it being found out, and you have to maintain it, maintain consistency, which is often where people get caught out, and cognitively your brain is really going to work. Um, so, uh, some things that happen are, apparently, uh, you blink less when you're lying, if blinking is taking up too much energy. Um, and we tend to overcompensate when we're lying, <laughs> body language wise. Uh, I, I think I should be looking them in the eyes, so I'll stop blinking and stare at them. Um, we, when you're nervous, you fidget a lot, but when you're lying, again, the fidgeting goes down because you're putting all that effort into uh, lying. Um, apparently men, sorry men again, use fewer hand gestures when they're lying. You can try this out later, because um, men can't think as quickly. Um, and both sexes <coughs> pause longer. Um, the other thing we do when we lie is we try to hide the lie. Uh, and the older you are, uh, the more subtle this becomes. So this is where this comes from. Yeah, you're all great, you're all interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad I'm doing this talk. Uh, and I'm trying to basically cover up the lie. I hope they don't see the, uh, the lie that's coming out of my... That wasn't a lie. Um, and so when we're adults, this becomes subtle face touching. Kids tend to be more like, no, it wasn't me. Um, and then that's the other thing, the eyes. Sorry, I'm rushing a bit now. Uh, and the main thing with lying is to look for a lack of congruence, a lack of agreement between what's being said and what the body's saying. So if somebody's looking away, fiddling with the collar, get that sweat in there out, uh, fiddling around up here. And apparently blood goes to your nose as well, which is another reason, because your face flushes. Um, there's a, a guy on English TV called Darren Brown, who's like a stage magician type guy, and one of his acts is to have a load of people and tell them which person is lying about some information he's given them. And apparently he's practiced reading these little flushes that we get, you just can't control. Nobody can control it. Blood goes to your face, probably to help your brain out. Now most people can't see it. It's very, very, very subtle. So just because somebody's red in the face, they might have just run up the stairs. It doesn't mean they're lying to you about why they're late for that class and had to run up the stairs. Um, uh, we all know about crossed arms, don't we? Uh, the, the main thing with the crossed arms thing is um, it could mean lots of things. I'm cold, uh, this is just comfortable, uh, and so on. Um, crossed legs is another one. Which can be standing. Um, Prince Charles, do you think he's very comfortable talking to crowds? He wants to cross his arms, but he can't because he's the prince of some country. So what does he do instead? He goes for the cuff. Fiddles with his cuff. How are you, poor person? Uh, 
please don't attack me, please don't stab me. I'm sure that's not what he's thinking. Um, just, uh, I've got to quickly run through this. Power plays is where things come into work, probably with directors. Um, often it's to do with me telling you that I'm smarter than you. Uh, the classic gesture is leaning back with the hands behind the head, just making myself bigger. My head is obviously <coughs> ten times bigger than yours now. You're all idiots. Uh, and so on. Um, the making yourself bigger various ways, the rocking up and down on the feet. <laughs> we can all try this out on Jeremy Harmer tomorrow because he's not here. <laughs> Sorry, video. Um, the, the, the thumbs on the lapel or in the pocket. Uh, it's all sort of generating a bigger size. You're an idiot. I don't know why I'm wasting my time talking to you. Um, and possession. If you've got a new car or a new girlfriend and I say, can I have a photo of you with your car or girlfriend or both, what will you do automatically? Most guys will lean on the car, arm around the girl. This is all about possession. Um, now, how this comes into power plays, when you want something from the director, instead of taking them out for coffee, as was suggested this morning, lean on the door of their office, and what you're basically saying is, this is mine. It might not be now. Or even better, sit on their desk. <laughs> um, sit on their chair. Uh, really got to... Mirroring is probably an expression people have heard before. This is where we uh, copy each other's body language. If you have a quick look around the room, you'll be able to see which people like each other, which people are comfortable. Um, we tend to sort of naturally mirror. It's used in things like interview techniques and so on. Uh, um, and the feeling is that, you know, we've got a link, we've got a bond. I don't know why, um, but we're quite similar people and therefore we'll get on. However, you could also try it out at a bus stop <laughs> and just stand next to a complete stranger and just copy everything they do. So when their arms get crossed, then you cross your arms. <laughs> And then when they scream and see what they think of you after that. Um, so as we said before, it's all about context, clusters of messages. Um, you can't take one thing and say, aha, this person's lying, this person's negative, they've got their arms crossed, so what? By the way, if you want something interesting to try, try crossing your arms the other way around and you'll see how long and suited, how comfortable you are with that. Um, and it's basically about awareness raising. You can't learn overnight about body language and how to see it and how to do it. It's just raising awareness. And I think, more importantly, is raising awareness of my own body language. Like, what, how am I coming across to this person? I often catch myself interviewing people and realising that I'm sort of... Uh, <laughs> and then they run out of the room because they think I'm going to hug them. Um, so it takes a long time. I mean, people train for years. We, we, uh, I was actually working in the prison. I should dispel any uh, misconceptions now. Um, and the, the open body language is something you had to consciously focus on because it was a high tension situation. Uh, and if your body language is negative or aggressive in any way, that could uh, spur up situations. Um, your homework is to spend the rest of the conference analysing each other's body language until somebody punches somebody else. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.